everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're going to get started in just a minute as we wait for people to filter in. All right, so it's just after five o'clock and I'd like to welcome everyone to this session. I'm Haley Randall, the program assistant for the Zoo and Aquarium All Hazards Partnership. Before we begin, let's just go through a few quick housekeeping and logistical reminders. This session will be 90 minutes long, including a panel Q&A. Automated live transcription will be enabled for this webinar. To disable this feature, view a full transcript in a separate window or change the settings, click the caret next to the live transcript at the bottom of your screen. All participants are muted and in listen-only mode. Attendees are invited to submit questions for panelists throughout the session by using the Q&A feature found at the bottom of the screen. Panelists will answer as many questions as possible during the live Q&A session at the end of this webinar, but may not be able to address all submissions during the time allotted. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available via our website, zap.org, shortly after broadcast. Registrants will also receive a link to access the recording via email. Thanks, Haley. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining us today for this session on highly pathogenic avian influenza. Uh, I'm Ashley Zielinski, director for the ZAP program and your moderator for today. We're really excited to have a wonderful panel of subject matter experts joining us from USDA as well as the zoo community to talk about this important topic. So our first speaker, uh, is Dr. Chrislyn Wood, a poultry specialist and veterinary medical officer with USDA's Veterinary Services. Uh, and she's here to start us off with an overview of the current outbreak and response. So take it away, Dr. Wood. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Chris Lynn Wood. I'm a um, poultry specialist veterinary medical officer with USDA APHIS Veterinary Services. Um, I'm giving this presentation on behalf of Dr. Julie Gauthier. She's our um, assistant director of poultry health uh, for USDA. And I'm just going to cover um, the background of highly pathogenic avian influenza um, avian influenza virus and the role of USDA um, with these highly pathogenic avian influenza outbreaks. Uh, this is a picture of me um, during the 2015 outbreak, kind of at the start of the, that was our last big high path AI outbreak. And this was when the outbreak had first started um, on the West Coast. Um, and some of the smaller backyard flocks in Washington state before it spread um, more towards the Midwest and affected the uh, commercial poultry industry. So um, just some background on avian influenza virus. It's an orthomyxovirus. Influenza A um, found is type is the type that's found in birds. So with it being an uh, RNA virus, um, RNA viruses um, are susceptible to changes during replication because they don't have the proofreading mechanism that other um, DNA viruses have. So they make mistakes and they have a tendency to change or mutate. So um, the surface proteins that we look for on the outside of the virus to identify it are mostly the hemagglutinin or H uh, protein or the neuroremedies and um, type. So in birds, there's H types one through 16 and um, N types one through nine. So there's 144 different H and N combinations. And the H7, H5 and H7 are the two subtypes that have the known ability to mutate from a low pathogenic form to a highly pathogenic form. So for the most part, we deal with um, the low pathogenic form of avian influenza, 
uh, where birds are um, might be infected, but they normally don't show much clinical signs or the clinical signs are very mild. Um, so sometimes they might have a small drop in egg production or some respiratory signs, or sometimes they don't show clinical signs at all. And um, wild birds and uh, especially ducks and geese, wild waterfowl fowl especially, are known um, carriers or reservoirs for avian influenza where they don't normally show clinical signs. But the issue is that when um, those birds carry avian influenza and it gets into a domesticated flock or a captive flock, um, especially chickens and turkeys, and even um, some of the bird types that you're, you deal with in the zoos um, and the rehab centers, um, those birds, um, gallinaceous birds in particular, may become sick and die in high numbers um, if it mutates to, or the virus is a highly pathogenic form of avian influenza. So there's lots of bird types that can be carriers. I mentioned the um, waterfowl, but we found um, other wild bird carriers, um, gulls, shorebirds, uh, vultures and sparrows. Um, so there's lots of other wild bird types that can carry avian influenza. So I'm just gonna briefly cover our main um, 2015 outbreak. This was the largest um, high path AI outbreak or largest um, animal disease outbreak affecting US agriculture to date. Um, so there were 211 detections on commercial poultry operations and 21 detections in backyard poultry operations, approximately 7.4 million turkeys and 43 million egg layer and pullet chickens were affected by high path AI and died from the disease or had to be depopulated. Um, so including the wild bird detections, there were 21 states affected um, during the 2015 outbreak. Um, so you can see from the map, um, lots of states were affected. That outbreak started more on the West Coast um, and kind of spread um, eastward. But this current outbreak, which I'll talk about, has started on the East Coast and is spreading westward the opposite direction. Uh, this is a um, map from the um, OIE or Office of um, um, International Epizootes or basically our um, World Health Organization for Animal Health. And these slides were put together by Dr. Sherry Wainwright from USDA Center for Epidemiology and Animal Health. And it just shows a screenshot of um, the high pathogenic avian influenza outbreaks overseas um, because this virus, we saw it in the wild birds and the domestic birds overseas first before we saw it um, in the United States. So this map is from October 1st, um, 2020 to November, I'm sorry, September 30th of 2021. And um, you can see um, most of the dots and the um, triangles, so the dots are domestic poultry and the cir um, circles are, I'm sorry, I said that backwards. The, yeah, the dots are domestic poultry, the triangles are wild bird cases, but most of them are light blue. And that is indicating the H5N8 um, subtype of highly pathogenic avian influenza. So that was the predominant strain um, basically from fall 2020 into 2021. But when we they went into um, 2021 to 2022, and this map shows um, January 1st, 2021 to January 14th of 2022, you can see the dots and the triangles have turned green, indicating H5N1. So the virus shifted a little bit and became this H5N1 subtype. Um, so we saw a spike um, internationally throughout Europe, um, parts of Asia, 
and um, and Africa, um, and a lot more than than normal years. Um, really, back in 2020, and then even more in 2021 into 2022. And these outbreaks are still continuing in Europe, Asia, and Africa now. And the subtype that has been found overseas, um, Europe and Asia, the H5N1, um, it's a goose guandong lineage. Um, it's, it's called clade 2.3.4.4b. And this is this exact same subtype that is being found here in the United States this year. Also on the map, um, you'll see the um, in Canada and Newfoundland, Canada in November 2021, um, they had a wild bird detection and a great um, black-billed gull um, in Newfoundland. Um, and some of those birds had neurological signs um, swimming in circles, head tilt, and lack of coordination. And then soon after that, in December of 2021, was the first finding in a domestic flock. It was a multi-species exhibition flock um, that was found. And there were 360 out of 409 um, birds that died um, in that flock to the disease. And it was a mix of different bird types, um, chickens, geese, silkies, peafowl, turkeys, ducks, and emu. Um, but none of those birds were for sale, but it was a um, domestic flock. And that was the first finding of high path AI um, in the Americas um, since the June um, 2015, um, the last big outbreak in the US. Um, then shortly after that, um, January 9th, um, 2022, there was a second domestic um, backyard flock in Canada, also in Newfoundland, that was detected. That was a smaller flock with 17 birds. There were three chickens and 14 ducks. Um, the chickens um, and the gallinaceous bird species, um, they did exhibit clinical signs and a lot of them died but the ducks um, remained pretty much healthy uh, visually. So soon after that, um, June, um, I'm sorry, January 13th, we had our first detection here in the United States in um, wild birds in uh, South Carolina of the H5N1 um, strain. That's the same as the Eurasian strain um, within a week. And then that's when we started seeing a lot of our wild bird cases. And then in February is when it started to spread to the domestic poultry flocks. Um, so this is just a, a graph to show um, for overseas how the outbreak started um, in Europe, Asia, and Africa, how it started with the H5N8 in domestic poultry. There was a small spike but then um, by the fall of 2020, um, there was a shift in the uh, wild birds, a spike in the wild birds, H5N8. And then a couple months after that is when it followed in the domestic birds. And then um, around um, the summertime, the cases were low, um, but it kind of came back up in 2021. 20, um, So um, USDA, um, we do a lot of education. Um, we deal with avian influenza very often, um, more with the domestic flocks and we try to do education. These are some slides from our um, Defend the Flock campaign that's with USDA. And so we educate about um, how the disease is spread, spread through direct contact with sick birds, or by indirect contact um, through people movement, um, through hands, um, shoes, clothes, and equipment that's not cleaned properly. Um, we educate to know the people that know the signs of um, avian influenza. Anytime you see an increase in mortality that's more than normal, um, drop in feed production, water intake, 
and respiratory signs. And sometimes neurological signs are the signs to look for. With high pathogenic avian influenza, um, the entire flock can be affected if it's left unchecked. Um, the death rate can be the whole entire flock, um, again, if it's left unchecked. And um, unfortunately, there's no real good treatment. Um, there's not a, a good vaccine for um, avian influenza. It's only been um, the vaccine would have to be very specific to that individual strain. And it's a little complicated, but it's... Um, takes a while, would take a while to develop and would not really be used often because of international trade implications. So um, this is a map of our US wild bird detections. To date, we have 376 um, wild bird detections here in the US. And um, this information we, can be found on our USDA APHIS website. Um, there's two different links. If you go under 2022 detections for high path AI, there's the wild bird link, and then there's the domestic um, commercial poultry and backyard poultry link. Um, so you can see um, a lot of states detected this time this year, um, it's all, on the East Coast, all up and down the East Coast, and you can see how it's starting to spread um, westward. So there's 24 states um, that are currently affected um, that have had wild bird detections of high path AI. And then this slide shows our um, domestic poultry. Um, so there are actually, there was one detection added just today, a couple hours ago. Um, so there are 16 states um, that are currently affected. The one detected today was um, New Hampshire, a um, non-commercial backyard flock. Um, but you can see the states affected and on the map here shows the counties that have been affected. Um, so lots of activity on the East Coast, but you can see it's starting to spread uh, westward. Um, before, um, yeah, this past week, um, a large commercial flock um, of layer chickens was identified in Wisconsin, and it's a big three million um, bird uh, facility. So a lot of um, work and follow up that needs to be done. Um, so twenty two um, um, kind of commercial poultry flocks that have been affected. And then what we call non-poultry or just basically non-commercial or more backyard flock type birds, um, 13 now, including uh, the New Hampshire case that was added today. And most of the cases have been in um, chickens and, and turkeys. Um, both um, egg laying chickens and broiler meat chickens, and then turkeys. So um, for USDA Veterinary Services, we have a huge extensive response process for highly pathogenic avian influenza, um, where, you know, if we, um, we encourage farmers to report um, an increase in mortality or sick or dead birds um, so that we can diagnose the problem quickly and quarantine so that the virus doesn't spread and try to take care of it and clean up the farm so um, other flocks are not affected. Um, I just wanna definitely make sure it's clear that USDA Vet Services does not um, endorse any mass euthanasia of zoo birds or um, the wild um, birds in the rehab facilities. Um, that strategy is mostly used for um, domestic birds. But we um, encourage our farmers to report birds and um, the samples are identified or tested through our local laboratories and then the samples are forwarded to USDA National Vet Services Laboratory in Ames, Iowa for confirmation. And then once we know for sure that the samples are confirmed for avian, highly pathogenic avian influenza, 
Our goal is to try to depopulate within 24 hours to start that process of depopulation to control the virus. Uh, farmers are paid an indemnity um, value for their birds. Um, and then uh, value of the um, cleanup process, based, basically we call it virus elimination. So there's an extensive process involved um, to try to clear the virus uh, from a premise and then within the area. So it can take a long time. Um, but for your group, um, we um, work collaboratively with our sister USDA agencies, Wildlife Services and Animal Care. Um, and so we encourage, um, especially during this really high risk time, uh, we've never seen this many wild bird um, high path AI detections ever in the United States. So this is very, a really high risk um, period. Um, and so we're encouraging um, anybody that has birds, um, you know, and we understand for the zoo community, it's, it's difficult, but uh, we encourage to limit con any contact with uh, wild birds, keeping birds away from, um, from ponds and other open water sources that might attract wild birds, and just understand that uh, wild birds and their feathers, their feces, other organic material can carry um, virus. Um, so even when we have domestic uh, flocks that are affected, um, like for example, in um, Delaware and Maryland, we have some flocks that are affected. We contacted wildlife services to um, try to do some mitigation for some vultures that were in the area because we don't want the virus to spread from that facility to other facilities. Um, so we encourage uh, reporting of sick birds. Um, we work with the state departments of agriculture and um, university cooperative extension. And this is our USDA um, hotline where people can report um, increased mortality and we can you know, come out quickly and respond to test the birds to at least give an answer to know, are the birds affected with avian influenza or is it something else? And if it's something else, which oftentimes it, it may be, um, you, know, you can work with your local laboratory for a diagnosis. So these are just some um, screenshots about our Defend the Flock campaign. Um, there's lots of videos and um, resources available um, to help educate. Um, so some of the, most of the principles are geared towards domestic birds, but some of the principles can apply to um, zoos and wild uh, bird facilities. Um, so for example, talking about how biosecurity is a team effort. So if everybody and the facility is on the same page and understands just ways to reduce the risk, that is um, very helpful. Um, isolation of new incoming animals from um, the resident flock, you know, that's important. Regular cleaning and disinfection of um, um, materials and equipment used to handle the birds is important too. And just knowing if you have sick birds, you know, to, to do some kind of testing. Um, so here are our websites, um, USDA, Defend the Flock or Avian Influenza, you can just Google that. And there's lots of information there. Um, we have a bigger presence now on social media, on Facebook and Twitter. Um, there's a newsletter now uh, for Defend the Flock that has good tips and there's even a YouTube channel. So um, I will stop sharing and that's all I have and I'll wait till the end for any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Wood. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Kevin Benson from USU Animal Care here to talk about animal care's role and response and the importance of biosecurity. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Benson. Oh, we can't hear you, Dr. Benson. Sorry, I'm just... Uh trying to figure out where my PowerPoint went on the share screen. Uh, let me see if I can 
Here we go. Uh, here it is. Okay, and I need to switch the sets. There we go. How's that? Looks good. There we go. Is that is that good? Okay. All right. So I'm going to move along here pretty quickly. I'm, I'm Kevin Dennis, and I'm with USDA APHIS Animal Care in Fort Collins, Colorado. And uh, both Dr. Jeannie Lynn and I, myself, are both uh, supporting the VS Incident Coordination Group, uh, particularly emphasizing captive wild birds. Uh, as far as captive wild birds, APHIS Veterinary Services is the lead federal agency for high-path avian influenza and domestic birds. Uh, most captive wild bird cases are going to be managed under state authorities. Uh, and so we can provide recommendations and support. Uh, but uh, the, the state uh, animal health officials and wildlife officials are going to be heavily involved in any uh, captive wild uh, bird facility outbreaks. Uh, and then over the years, APHIS has coordinated a lot with the zoo animal, excuse me, zoo all hazards partnership. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a little bit here. So uh, as far as OIE, World uh, Organization for Animal Health, uh, there's no requirement for uh, euthanasia of infected or exposed captive wild birds uh, while there is in poultry or poultry species. Uh, the cases are, in fact, though, reportable to OIE, and the cases are not supposed to affect trade, but uh, that's been kind of a constant challenge to, uh, to make sure that uh, other nations understand uh, the significance of wild bird outbreaks and, and uh, and uh, they don't always agree about the trade issues. Uh, while APHIS does not uh, provide direction, direct direction to uh, uh, state animal health officials, we do have some suggestions about how these cases are, are uh, pursued. And this has been ex extensively discussed within the incident coordination group. Uh, and of course, it starts with confirmation of the diagnosis, uh, notification, uh, probably an interim quarantine on the facility by the state. Uh, if there's domestic poultry species on site, there's probably going to be euthanasia along with uh, an indemnity uh, agreement. Uh, the next step's really important, and that's the facility uh, needs to work with uh, state officials and others to conduct a risk, risk assessment and biosecurity evaluation and, and development of a either a written or, or at least a, a well-understood, well-documented uh, uh, biosecurity and response plan, similar to the flock plan that's used in a uh, domestic poultry outbreak. And then uh, the, the, between the state and the facility, there's going to be monitoring to make sure that the uh, response and biosecurity plan are are being uh, met, and then eventually quarantine is uh, released once the plan is successfully completed. And, and I know that's that probably leaves a lot of question marks, but uh, I think in general this is a pretty sensible way to to go about uh, addressing these cases. Uh, so back to animal care in our roles, uh, we normally uh, enforce the Animal Welfare Act, uh, and, and a number of captive wild bird facilities are, are uh, regulated under the Animal Welfare Act. We also uh, enforce the Animal, excuse me, the Horse Protection Act. We have a Center for Animal Welfare, which does education and outreach and training, and then we have a small emergency management staff as well. If we do have some bird regulations in in the uh, in the plan. They they're, were recently published as draft regulations. They really don't have a direct impact on uh, the uh, HPAI issues. The animal, the bird regulations are, are not in effect yet, and the regulations that cover 
disease response are, are really different regulations from the Animal Welfare Act. So just want to make that clear. Uh, just wanted to give a little plug to ZAP that uh, uh, animal care and wildlife services and veterinary services have uh, worked with uh, ZAP and its predecessor organizations for a lot of years since before 2008. Uh, Animal care provides cooperative funding each year uh, and uh, really look at ZAP as our interface with the zoological community. And we've had multiple collaborative projects and uh, they were invaluable in 2015 in the latest HPIA uh, outbreak. And uh, you'll consider to be one of our most important uh, partnerships, most important cooperative agreements. Uh, as far as animal care roles, uh, Jeannie and myself uh, are sitting in on the uh, uh, path avian influenza incident coordination group, along with uh, uh, one of our assistant uh, directors of animal welfare operations, uh, Gustavo Sobrano. And uh, we uh, have provided uh, uh, Responders to Avis Veterinary Services in the past. Uh, in 2015, over 20% of animal care deploy, employees deployed to HBAI. We've sent a lot of people out to uh, very with Newcastle disease, and uh, some of our st staff deployed for multiple uh, incidents, uh, multiple times in each incident, uh, some people even three or four times. So, uh, but we're we're just absolutely happy to support uh, VS in, in episodes like this. Uh, our field inspectors, just to make it clear uh, as what they do and don't do, uh, they're often the most familiar element of APHIS at many uh, zoos or other facilities regulated under the Animal Welfare Act. Uh, we keep them updated on HPAI, uh, and they're able to facilitate outreach and communications. And uh, uh, they are required to file, follow both animal care and organizational biosecurity procedures at captive wildlife facilities during inspections. Uh, as far as what they, they don't do, uh, they're not the right people to report uh, sick birds uh, through attending veterinarians. Those reports shouldn't go to animal care. Those should go to state animal health officials, also known as state veterinarians, or to APHIS veterinary services. And, and uh, while we do have people in the past who have deployed with HPAI responses, uh, they're not going to go onto uh, captive wild bird facilities if they've recently been part of an HPAI response. So there's, there's uh, a waiting time after deployment before they enter a, uh, uh, another uh, avian facility. So now we're going to jump into uh, some details pertaining to biosecurity and risk management. Uh, and just a couple initial concepts, and that's uh, when you're talking biosecurity planning, one of the first things you need to do is get uh, uh, make sure that your management is on board and that they really uh, uh, take the biosecurity issue very, very seriously. Uh, you need to address biosecurity holistically. In other words, it's not just PPE cleaning and disinfection. There's a lot more to it. And, and we'll talk about the CDC hierarchy of controls in just a second. Uh, it takes a lot of people giving input to biosecurity planning to make it work. And, uh, you know, it's not only people at the facility, but attending veterinarians, uh, animal health and animal uh, wildlife agencies and, and, and certainly management. And my recommendation is really to think about two plans. And first plan is what can we do today in the short term to start improving biosecurity at our facility? And the second thing is to think about what long range planning do we need to engage in that may involve uh, physical renovation or other major changes that may have to wait a while. So, so, uh, and, and I think both of these are important to keep in mind. Uh, as far as hierarchy of controls, uh, PPP is PPE is is really on the bottom end of the scale here, as the least effective. 
And and this this hierarchy of controls is used by uh, CDC NIOSH, uh, which is the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, for looking at uh, safety planning uh, within the workplace. And so there's different uh, elements here, like elimination. Uh, if you stop taking in certain species of uh, wild birds or sick wild birds into a rehabilitation uh, facility, that's that's an act of elimination, eliminate the hazard. Engineering controls, uh, we'll talk about a lot of those things, but would be to uh, uh, create compartment, compartmentalization within the facility where you're not moving things back and forth. Uh, administrative controls is how people work, uh, you know, making sure that people aren't going uh, back and forth from one area to another without undergoing uh, cleaning and disinfection, uh, that type of thing. And PPE is then at the bottom of the list. Still important, but, but other things can be more important. So one of the ways to look at uh, biosecurity is through planning categories. And so I'm going to talk about each one of these quickly, but just keep in mind that every captive wildlife facility is different. Uh, we have everything from the largest zoos down to uh, mom and pop uh, wildlife rehabilitation operations where it's it, it's a couple people and, and they're doing it out of their house. So uh, not every recommendation could possibly be uh, equal, equally applicable to uh, each uh, facility. So let's look at the first thing, which is intake and triage. Uh, for zoos, there's usually a planned quarantine process for incoming uh, collection birds, much more planful uh, process, and, and I don't think we need to say too much there. For wildlife rehabilitation, this is maybe their one of their biggest uh, sources of, of risk. And so during situations where there's a high risk of HPAI, are you going to continue to accept all types of birds? Are you gonna accept uh, waterfowl and shorebirds uh, if birds are sick? If there's HPAI in the area, are you gonna uh, bring in scavengers? Uh, each facility has to decide uh, in consultate in consultation with wildlife officials, what birds should they actually be bringing in to their facility? Uh, we really recommend a triage area that's separate from all the other birds, whether it's uh, in an isolation room uh, that's got an ex external entrance or whether you have, uh, like a lot of places are doing right now, they're doing a triage, triage outside the building. And, and if they're not going to bring in the animal uh, into the, the uh, facility, uh, they might euthanize it in the in the uh, in outdoors and and go through a uh, uh, a secure method of making sure you don't bring anything for that bird indoors. Uh, some are just not accepting those certain types of birds and are, are not having the public even bring them in. Uh, it just depends on on what you need to do for your facility. Uh, another big issue is separation uh, from of uh, birds in the collection or birds in the facility from free ranging wild birds. Uh, eliminating commingling in lakes, ponds, or, or other uh, habitats. Uh, some, some zoos have been moving their birds indoors uh, during elevated risk times. Uh, it's not as easy to do for all types of birds and for all durations, uh, but it's certainly a consideration. Uh, Deterrent strategy for free ranging wild birds. You know, can you use uh, things like horizontal wire grids that are flagged uh, above uh, pools or ponds within the facility? Uh, can you do other deterrents? And, and Wildlife Services has a, uh, a repertoire of deterrent strategies that uh, they can share if, if you need some help with that. Uh, Making sure that you don't have feed sources out that uh, free ranging wild birds can can access will help. Uh, and then a lot of zoos have had uh, uh, populations of uh, free roaming uh, gallinaceous birds such as peafowl. And I think those are highly susceptible birds and zoos need to really sit down and think, you know, what's the risk from having these birds running loose? What can we do 
And the answer isn't the same for each uh, zoo, but if you do get HPAI, there'll probably be a uh, requirement to uh, euthanize the peafowl and other uh, really low conservation value uh, gallinaceous birds. Compartmentalization is another concept, which is trying to put up barriers within the facility, either physical or functional, to where if, if you get HPAI into one compartment, it doesn't necessarily infect the whole facility. And that could include your triage or quarantine area, uh, your supply and receiving area, and then these are just examples uh, for uh, uh, you want to prioritize your conservation critical populations, uh, and you also want to, uh, uh, if you're a rehabilitation facility with educational birds, obviously those birds have a uh, an important value as well uh, to make sure they don't get infected. When it comes to detecting and managing infectious disease, uh, there's been a lot of uh, discussion about active observational surveillance. And I think originally in, in uh, when it was the Zoo Animal Health Network, there was actually some uh, some uh, uh, PowerPoint files on that that were really good. Uh, I'm not sure where those are, but but the idea that people look at every bird every day and and keep records on on, on groups of birds or individual birds, how they're doing, if they're eating, and, and really pay close attention. Obviously, birds don't show signs of illness quite as easily as, as uh, for instance, people do. Uh, and making sure you work with your attending veterinarian to have uh, adequate uh, care for sick birds, uh, uh, some diagnostic and, and necropsy protocols, and, and uh, report any cases that you think might be consistent with HPAI to your state animal health officials uh, or APHIS veterinary services right away. Uh, supply, and supply chain risks uh, are important. Uh, sources of feed, uh, such as whole frozen feeder birds, chicks, or, or, or quail, uh, you need to consider what the source of those is. Is that a, uh, uh, a facility that's uh, certified under the National Poultry Improvement Plan, or, or do they have uh, a biosecurity plan that helps ensure that they're not accidentally uh, introducing HPAI to your facility through those feeders. Uh, if you've got a rehabilitation facility, uh, I know there some some facilities will actually feed uh, free ranging wild birds that have been euthanized upon intake to uh, to raptors. But I think at this point in time, that's that's a really poor choice. Uh, when it comes to vendors or deliveries, uh, are those vehicles coming on? on site into your habitat areas? Are they staying outside the facility? Do you have a delivery area? Uh, do you know where those delivery vehicles have been prior to coming to your facility or where they go afterwards? Uh, you know, I think these are all things to consider uh, in biosecurity planning. And then risk to and, and from staff, volunteers and visitors. Uh, are you asking people to uh, maintain dedicated work clothing and change when they get there? Uh, are, are those uh, items laundered on site or the people go home with that clothing? Uh, you have rules uh, for offsite bird contact uh, by staff, volunteers, and veterinarians. Uh, uh, I know some, uh, a lot of commercial poultry facilities do not allow their employees to keep pet birds or poultry at home. And I know some of the zoos that have uh, conservation critical populations of birds uh, have similar requirements. So, and if you have an attending veterinarian, does that veterinarian see avian clients uh, if they're an offsite contractor and what steps are taken uh, in between when that veterinarian sees other birds and when they come to your facility? Uh, public visitation policies, I think are, are certainly a concern and I think with COVID-19, there's a lot of zoological facilities that have really looked hard at how to uh, distance their their uh, collections from uh, close contact with visiting public. And then, as importantly, we want to be concerned over human inf infection. Uh, this particular high-path avian influenza has not shown much potential for spreading into humans. 
But one of the hallmarks of, of zoonosis management is making sure that you try to keep it that way, that we don't give opportunities for this virus to spread into humans or mutate. And, and one of the concerns is co-infection of a person with seasonal influenza as well as a, an avian influenza and increasing the possibility for a mutation that might uh, uh, you know, contribute towards an eventual pandemic. And, and we've all seen how thoroughly dangerous uh, the concept of a zoonotic pandemic is. And, and then uh, if you do get infected, it's important that uh, you contact local public health or state public health and discuss a staff monitoring plan to where if a staff member does become ill with a respiratory uh, virus uh, after contact with birds, that they go get tested for influenza. And if they do turn positive, is very, uh, they may want to take samples just to ensure that it's, that it's a human influenza and not an avian influenza. And some uh, uh, facilities have also uh, had the people that work with birds uh, recommended they follow CDC's uh, protocols for prevention of seasonal human influenza. As far as an environmental risk, uh, what, what proximity are you to other avian facilities, whether they're captive wild bird facilities, backyard facilities, or commercial poultry? And if you're very close, is there uh, considerations for trying to minimize uh, risk there? Uh, also, cold, wet environments uh, contribute to HVAI surviving for for a longer period of time. And so, uh, you know, looking at uh, improving drainage, uh, looking at flood control, if you get some localized flooding, is it going to be bringing in water from streams, or canals, or, or avian facilities? Uh, as far as cleaning and disinfection, uh, Really, do you have written uh, policies and SOPs on cleaning and disinfection? And do you train your staff and volunteers on training and, uh, on cleaning and disinfection? Uh, are you selecting the right disinfectants? Uh, luckily, avian influenza is reasonably easy to kill, but you, you need to make sure that the disinfectant you're using has an EPA label for influenza virus. And uh, they're on the EPA's website, they, they do list uh, disinfectants with uh, labels for avian influenza. And, and then management of uh, difficult surfaces. In other words, if you've got dirt, gravel, wood surfaces, plants, et cetera, those are really hard to disinfect. Uh, and, and so if you have those uh, in your avian exhibit areas, is there, uh, or other areas where birds might come into, is there ways that you can help mitigate some of that uh, risk? So, uh, in summary, there's really no silver bullets uh, in biosecurity. Uh, biosecurity, uh, and I, I like something that Dr. Hall said on her uh, presentation a few uh, a while back from the University of Minnesota, and that's biosecurity is really hard. And, uh, uh, you know, look for more ideas at the Secure Zoo uh, Zap Stripe site. Uh, just Consider that biosecurity is a team effort, that it needs to be part of both your short-term plan for disease prevention as well as your long-term strategic plan, and, and have a, uh, a plan that encompasses both the risk to animals as well as people. And, and that's kind of a veterinary joke in the picture because uh, that's actually a silver bullet cattle rumen magnet. So uh, there you go. So there actually is a silver bullet. It's just not a biosecurity bullet. Uh, and this is the contact information for Jeannie and I, and uh, we've been answering, we've been you know, on a lot of calls with uh, facilities, and we're happy to talk to people. Uh, with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen in a minute and uh, go from there. Thank you very much, Dr. Tennyson. Uh, next, we have a group of speakers here from the zoo community and wildlife community to provide some insights into what prevention and protection can look like at facilities. Uh, first is Dr. Trevor Zachariah, Director of Veterinary Programs from Brevard Zoo. Go ahead, Dr. Zachariah. Okay, thank you very much, Ashley. Let me just bring this up. Okay, so just to give you um, 
a little bit of our experience as we've gone through an, an outbreak in our wild bird population here in Central Florida on the Atlantic coast, um, right uh, on zoo grounds even. So we, um, we had a, a um, animal disease outbreak plan in place that was fairly generic and it basically was a scaffold that could be fleshed out at any point um, with details based on whatever disease we um, might encounter. So in this case, we took our scaffold um, and we fleshed it out for avian influenza. So the first um, detection of influenza in the HPAI in Florida occurred in Palm Beach County, which was south of us. And that was the end of January, beginning of February this year. There'd already been a number of reports, as Chrislyn mentioned, uh, north uh, along the east coast of North America. So we were pretty sure it was likely through into our area. Um, but those two uh, lesser scop that were found in Paul Beach County were hunted birds that were um, tested by surveillance. And so we were really hopeful that that's all it would amount to. Uh, unfortunately, that wasn't the case, but um, our plan was divided into levels depending on the proximity to where a disease was. And so at this point, uh, we just we got to the level where um, we were within Florida with the disease and we had to take certain actions. Before this, it was um, somewhat in the region being in North Carolina and South Carolina and the Southeast United States. And so we were just on alert. Um, but at this point with it being in Florida, we had to take certain actions, which included um, starting to communicate with our regulatory, regulatory authorities. So we already had good relationships with our wildlife vet, um, vets here in Florida, our poultry vets and other um, state veterinarians. So we started um, communicating with them regularly. Uh, we started really monitoring for any uh, ill or deceased birds on two grounds and testing any that we might find. Um, talking to our marketing and communication staff because if we had to take any further steps um, with our animals under our care at the zoo, then we would have had to um, let the public know why we're doing that, make, you know, be transparent about what was going on. And then we work closely with the Florida Wildlife Hospital, which is down the road from us. And they're the primary wildlife rehab facility in our county. And um, we had to uh, stop treating avian cases uh, at that point from them because they were seeing most of the, the wildlife cases, at, uh, the wild bird cases at that point. Um, this plan's a little more detailed, but I didn't want to go into a, a ton of that and take up too much time. So hitting the high points, um, Unfortunately, uh, around mid-February, we discovered that, or confirmed that HPAI was definitely in our county um, with clinical wild birds. And again, this was mostly le lesser scop, um, which are um, duck species. They're kind of brownish blackish, and they were starting to pour into the wildlife hospital. So um, at this point, taking all the previous things we had done and adding to it, because the plan is cumulative, uh, we decided to take uh, further action to protect our birds uh, under our care at the zoo. And that included ceasing any avian contact activities for guests or volunteers. So we have two large walkthrough aviaries with um, fairly large flocks of uh, lorikeets and cockatiels plus various other birds. So several hundred birds in this one area. Um, guests were, and volunteers were no longer uh, permitted to go through there. All our avian ambassador animals were uh, those, the use of those was discontinued. And then we went through a, a number of steps to mitigate any um, wild bird uh, interactions around the zoo. So we have pellet feeders for wild birds and fish in our, a lot of our water um, features around the zoo. We uh, remove those. Um, we have a lot of birds that hang out around our concession areas, unfortunately, um, the, for obvious reasons. And so we had to make adjustments with uh, that. So uh, removing trash more frequently, posting more signs to not feed wild birds, um, things like that to try and decrease uh, human interaction. And then obviously we needed to protect the birds uh, at the zoo. And so this was one of the biggest things we had to do. And so this was, there was a, a, a large number of steps we took here, but basically uh, limiting keeper access, um, as was just mentioned, any uh, keepers that have uh, birds at home, especially backyard uh, poultry flocks, um, you know, uh, limiting their interaction with the birds at the zoo, 
increasing PPE and disinfection for um, keepers. Um, and then we ended up moving a lot of our birds indoors, as many as we could moving to indoor habitats to keep them away from uh, wild bird interactions. And the ones we couldn't, we had to modify their habitats. So putting tarps up or fine mesh, um, trying to prevent uh, interaction with wild birds or their um, excretions or anything like that that could expose them. And then we, um, with the Florida Wildlife Hospital, because they were being inundated with cases, uh, we stopped all in-person activities there. So we no longer actually went to their site to do rounds or, or treat cases at their facility. Um, they were also dealing with their own uh, measures and were being inundated and uh, having to deal with a lot of the similar issues. And so they uh, had um, not a lot of time to work with this anyway, because they were also scrambling to um, take care of their birds and deal with everything coming in. And so unfortunately, what we really feared the most was uh, something that happened shortly after it was found, uh, HBI was found in Brevard County. Uh, it actually uh, was detected at Brevard Zoo. So uh, February 17th, we got confirmation that a uh, black vulture that was clinical had been found on grounds on the 14th uh, was positive for HPAI. And so again, accumulative and adding to all the steps we had done before, we put together biosecure areas within our hospital at the zoo, um, two different areas, one for wild birds that might come in and one for our own collection birds for both treatment and testing in case of any animals that were deceased or ill. And then um, we postponed all elective avian procedures with our collection animals, just stop seeing them. Um, if it was anything that could be postponed, we postponed it. And then the one thing I forgot to put on here is we, um, a couple steps back, we also postponed any transactions with birds coming or going from the zoo. So we are not bringing in any birds right now and we're not uh, sending any birds out right now uh, because of this. So a lot of things uh, going on in steps, but um, fortunately we had been prepared and had developed this plan before it really hit because um, things happen quite quickly, quickly, as you can see with the timeline there. Um, and when it started hitting at the zoo, um, so far, it's all been black vultures, which is um, kind of interesting, but it does make sense because they are scavengers. And we had gotten reports that they had been seen, vultures had been seen eating or, or um, uh, preying upon uh, carcasses of wild ducks in the ponds and lakes around the zoo, because we're in Florida and we have lots of those. Um, and so clinical signs in, the, in these birds, um, some of them were found deceased, uh, lethargy was common, neurologic signs were extremely common, and then a couple of them actually had some bilateral corneal opacity, which we're not sure if that's primary uh, from the, the disease or a secondary problem. Here is just a quick video of uh, what one of these birds looks like when it presents. Um, you can see the bird's unable to stand, it's lethargic, and it's got head tremors. So this is pretty typical um, if they aren't uh, already deceased when they present to us. Okay, keep going, there we go. So this is just a really um, a visual representation of kind of what we've been dealing with. So um, you can see from the dates, the first vulture that presented to us on grounds was February 4th and it was confirmed on the 17th, the day after uh, HPAI was confirmed in Brevard County. So everything happened quite quickly and we had to be ready and we were fortunately prepared with our plan and had things already starting to go into place um, because all of this uh, occurred very rapidly. And so you can see we got a little break there in mid-February and then just recently, we had kind of a surge of the black vultures on grounds um, and uh, right into uh, just the end of last week. So um, that's what we've been dealing with so far um, in terms of our experience here at the zoo. Um, but, you know, uh, one of the things or some of the things that, you know, this is done in terms of its effects on us is you know, moving all those animals is no small feat um, and it creates a lot of stress on them to have to be in um, 
different habitats and uh, oftentimes these are much reduced and, and not as um, don't get as much variety and as much uh, enrichment as they do in their normal habitats. So it's very stressful on animals, of course, um, very stressful on keeper staff to have to change their protocols and um, limit what they can or cannot do, increase uh, disinfection and those kind of things. So um, lots of stress on, on staff. And then loss of income was a big one for the zoo in general because um, all of this happened right during uh, spring break season, which is a large, uh, you know, monetary um, or financial boon for us every year during this period. And uh, because of we're shutting down our aviaries and pulling birds, um, we felt the experience wasn't the same at the zoo for our guests. And so we decided not to do peak pricing uh, during this uh, outbreak. And so that's hurt us financially. And so has the lack of the aviary feeding in our um, in the lorikeets and cocktails where we do uh, feeding, which is pretty common. Um, that you know we budget for that as well, and so we've lost that income. So no no shortage or, or small number of effects that this has on us um, uh, as a zoological institution and having to deal with this. Um, so far, we've had only two birds that were one was ill and one was deceased that have been found since this all started. Um, in terms of our collection animals, and both of them have been negative so far. So we feel like we've been pretty successful at um, limiting the effects on our animals. And so we're, we're pretty happy with that, but there's lots of negatives to it too. And um, it's pretty stressful all around, but, um, but we've, we've managed it pretty well so far, we feel. So dose of cuteness there. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Zechariah. Uh, next up, we have James Balance, Senior Curator of Birds, Herpetology, and Ambassador Animals for Zoo Atlanta. Okay. Here we go. Can you see me? Are you seeing this? Yes. Yes? Yes. Okay, good. Um, Trevor, <laughs> I'm sorry you went through that. Uh, life here seems to be pretty easy by comparison. So I find myself on this uh, call really because when HPAI showed up again this year, I was calling around and talking to a lot of other zoos and realizing that we here at Atlanta actually have a very sophisticated document, I think. It's a 40 page document uh, for bird flu actions. And realizing that, I thought it might be worth sharing some of what we uh, actually went through. So basically we did a collection assessment. This, this is something that anyone can do. How many birds do you need to protect? What are those facilities that are available for those birds? Can you protect birds in their exhibits or do you need to move them indoors? Can you modify indoor space? Do you need to shift around other animals to provide bird space indoors? I mean, can you move some of those mammal things? and put these important birds in there. Um, there were a lot of zoos that really didn't have much of a plan going with this, um, but also assessing the likelihood of having issues with wild birds. Again, Trevor, a bunch of other zoos have a lot of wild birds coming into their facilities at night, uh, especially waterfowl. We're incredibly lucky. We had a duck on one of our ponds about four years ago, but that was the last time we saw a duck. So for us, we're really not worried to quite the same degree um, about our waterfowl, about our flamingos, etc. And as an institution, you kind of have to be, uh, determine what your level of risk is, what you're willing to tolerate. Um, as part of that assessment, also considering the welfare of the affected animals based on your plans for them. Trevor was just saying, bringing some of these animals in is very stressful on them and on the keepers. So if you can consider that in your original plan, it may make your life easier as you go along. And as a couple of people have also mentioned, do staff have birds at her home? And we surveyed them. And it was quite striking how few people, especially among our volunteers, had even heard that HPAI was a problem. Um, getting ready for HPI protection. This is a really important one. Get a clear expectation of what your institutional vet wants you to do physically with your spaces, also the state vets. But if you don't know what is really required of you, it's very hard to protect your animals. Plan how you're going to protect each bird space. Um, can you afford to do it? 
in 2022, one of the things we were looking at is stockpiling supplies. We haven't actually done it because supplies have been pretty steady. But this is all part of getting ready uh, and being ready to go when HPA does, HPA I does hit your institution or at least your state. Um, we got lucky, you know, protecting in place is probably the ideal way to do it if you can do it. Um, covering roof is an obvious one. Uh, it's much easier to do if you have slanted roofs on your, on your aviaries um, because water sheds it. Otherwise, you may have to take that into account. Um, think about what sort of light weight mesh you want to put onto the sides of aviaries to prevent wild bird feces entering exhibits. You can offset a second layer of mesh. What sort of mesh do you want? And I heard today of a zoo that has covered its uh, aviaries with actually mosquito netting, which is pretty protective. And I had not even thought of that one. What bi biosecurity measures are needed when you're accessing bird spaces? You can put together a pretty comprehensive plan, which will make your, the actual putting into action a lot easier. Prioritization. This is a tricky one. If you can't protect everyone, who do you do, uh, protect? Um, yeah, everyone's equal, but yeah are they really equal chicken condor who's actually going to make the chicken choice if you have to protect one of those birds it's going to be the condor so again in our plan even though we basically have a plan for every animal to be inside we have to also prioritize those birds if it came down to it what decisions would we make it's one of probably one of the most difficult things you can do um Looking to the future, will the HPI go away? Yeah, doesn't look like it. It seems to be cropping up every three, four years now. So I think for the future, a lot of zoos could do a lot more de designing for this. Can you create spaces where birds can easily be pro protected in HPAI? Don't put a flat roof on your aviary. I mean, really, it's just going to catch water. Do everything you can. Do you need an HPAI line item in your budget every year? Just have them set aside however much Zoo Atlanta's moderately well off zoo, especially right now. And the $10,000 it would take to probably cover all our exhibits is actually doable. But for not, not every institution is going to have that. Um, someone else mentioned this free ranging collection birds. Are you going to have to change that? Can you bring your peafowl in? Do you have guinea fowl and chickens running around? It might be something you have to look at in your long-term collection plan, whether this is really the way you want to go. And again, certain zoos are much more susceptible than others, depending upon the amount, number of wild birds you have coming in. So the basic tone here is plan, plan, plan. Have everything organized in advance. You know how you're going to do everything. That was a bit of a lecture. Okay, sorry about that. We're done. Thank you very much, James. Uh, and next we have Dr. Victoria Hall from the Raptor Center here to talk to us about some considerations for facilities with rehab. Awesome, thank you very much, Ashley. Um, well, hello everyone, Dr. Victoria Hall. Uh, Raptor Center is located at the University of Minnesota College of Veterinary Medicine. Um, and we just wanted to add a few brief comments about wildlife that is more transitory than our zoo animal collection birds, such as wildlife and rehabilitation settings. So we're talking about animals that come from the wild into our care and hopefully go back out into the wild uh, in a pretty short amount of time. So these animals are pretty high risk during this time of active HPAI transmission in our wild birds and do require some unique considerations. So up here in Minnesota, we're excited the snow's finally melting, but what comes with it are also the honking of geese and ducks. Um, usually very welcome sign of spring, uh, but we know right now with HPAI in the flyway um, that we've got to be on high alert, especially from the rehabilitation side. We also know that with this warmer weather, um, we're about to see a lot of animals coming into wildlife rehabilitation settings. And as members of the public find these animals, they're going to expect to be able to take them somewhere. We know very well that telling folks to let nature take its course and similar phrases doesn't tend to work very well with members of the public. So in this world of increased risk due to HPAI, how can you protect your facilities and operations if you have some of these more transitory or rehabilitation birds in your care? 
So this gets to the similar thing that we've been hearing from all of the fabulous speakers today um, about risk assessment, trying to get an idea of what risks are, are actually out there for your facility. Um, what are the consequences of these risks and how you can or maybe cannot actually present, protect against them. Especially with wildlife rehab, we know that there's sometimes a huge amount of different species that come through a facility in a short time. Knowing what HPAI looks like in different categories of species is going to help you a lot when you think through your facility's risk and protection mechanisms. Now, there is not science and data behind what it looks like in every single species of birds that you're going to see. So you might have to do a little bit of trying to find something that's close to get an idea. Um, but there are some distinct differences in groups of birds. So for example, as we know, the bird on the left, the duck, can carry the virus and shed it with no signs of illness, while the kestrel on the right is most likely very sick or dead within a week if they actually catch the virus. So very different presentations, very different risks to your facilities. Um, some facilities are opting to not admit species that can um, catch the virus but show no outward signs of illness, so like a duck, um, during this time of transmission in the country. Um, and this is a fair assessment. We looked at the hierarchy of controls um, in Dr. Dennison's talk, which is one of my favorite things. Um, if you remove the risk, a bird that can shed it without signs is a lot of risk, you decrease your risk a lot. Um, but we also know that there's a lot of facilities that are gonna continue to rehab these species because we know the public's gonna keep finding it and they're gonna keep trying to take them someplace. Um, so what these facilities can do then is look at different protective measures they can use to try and lower that risk. Um, and lower the chance that it can spread to other species within their facilities who might be very susceptible to illness or dying, um, and also to protect people. We've got to remember it's a zoonotic disease. So when we look at species, the birds that pop in my head are waterfowl, water birds, raptors, and we're seeing especially the bald eagles and vultures, um, and then those other scav scavenger guys like crows and ravens and gulls. So a key opportunity for protection of your facility is going to be your intake procedure. How can you help screen out those birds, like Dr. Dennison mentioned, uh, before they even get in your facility if they have HPAI symptoms? Anything that has unexplained neurologic or respiratory symptoms with no you know, clear answer or reason, you didn't just see them hit a car with their heads, um, those are gonna be highly suspicious. And if you can keep them from getting in your facility to begin with, then, you know that's one of the best things you can do. Um, I strongly caution against the use of rapid over-the-counter influenza tests. Um, so some folks are using human over-the-counter tests as a screening test for admitting birds into their rehab center. Um, these tests take a lot of virus to give you a positive result. So what that means is that they have low sensitivity, meaning you could end up with birds that test negative on your test and you let them into your population of birds, but they're actually positive and they can cause a lot of transmission in your facility. So because these tests have low sensitivity, meaning they can miss positives, um, they're not of great use as screening to allow birds into your facility. So your intake procedure can also be key for keeping different species separate. So I know some facilities that are sending their waterfowl to a different site for rehab this year, um, away from their more susceptible birds like raptors. Um, also some people, because we know that's not always feasible, are using different parts of their buildings, their enclosures, as Dr. Dennison mentioned, if we can segment these different birds of different risk, um, hopefully we can contain any issues that we might have. Um, and then your intake process is also very, very important if you have permanent resident birds, um, whether at a zoo or whether you have education birds. So we really, really, really want to keep these birds separate. Um, education birds are tricky because you end up having two different populations, the ones that are permanently in your care um, and the ones that are very transitory. So the more that you can use your facility to build a physical or invisible wall between these two populations, the better. Best case, you would take your ed birds and put them at a different place um, here at the Raptor Center. We can't do that. Um, so what we've done is we've created a lot of biosecurity between the main floor where the education birds are and our basement where we see about a thousand raptors a year for rehabilitation. Um, so really trying to look at your facility and how do you just keep them as separate as possible. Um, watch the food sources you're feeding your ed birds, um, feeding wild, a hunter shot waterfowl right now or poultry from insecure sources um, is not a good idea. Uh, looking at your caretakers. Some facilities can have dedicated caretakers for their rehab birds and their ed birds. Um, if you need to share, which some people just don't have enough staff, um, how can you, again, separate as much as possible? So clean clothes, clean boots, 
showering is even ideal, um, doing your ed birds in the morning and then your rehab birds later. How can you just continue to separate how you interact with these birds? Um, and then public programming is a big topic. Um, what risks does the public pose to your education birds and that they can bring with them uh, if you have on-site? And when you go off-site, it's not so much the risk of your bird directly catching HPAI, but more as you walk and drag carts and crates through the environment, you could pick up fomites or virus particles. Um, so we could have a whole talk just on kind of the ed bird side. Um, but once you get the rehab birds that come into your care, um, the best thing you can do is be on high alert for any, any unexplained um, illness, unexplained neurologic, respiratory, or unexplained or sudden death that happens in these guys. The quicker you can isolate that animal um, and detect it and know you have it, uh, the quicker you can respond, the more you're gonna protect the other birds in your care, um, as well as the people around it. Um, this eagle is having lead poisoning. It's a crummy time of year because we know that these lead eagle guys is also how HPAI eagles are, are presenting. Um, so there's no better time, as Dr. Dennison said, too, to focus on your biosecurity protocols. It is really hard to do it really, really well, but that does not mean that you can't do a lot of stuff that is going to dramatically reduce your risk. Um, you don't need a lot of financial resources to make huge improvements in your biosecurity protocols, and they'll help you not just for HPAI, but long into the future for other things. Um, focusing on your biosecurity protocols, your cleaning, your disinfectant. I mean, you can start with something as cost effective as bleach and go up to more expensive disinfectants, um, but you've got a lot of things that you can do. Protocols for the people that work around your birds, how do you control what they bring in, how you can control that unintentional interaction between your animals and outside wildlife, how you use personal protective equipment. There are so many things that everybody of all resource levels can start to do to dramatically make their facilities safer. Um, and now's a great time to look at ZAP resources um, and bulk back up. Um, and just to end, to know your resources, there are more and more resources being put out every day by state, by USDA, by ZAP. Um, the University of Minnesota Raptor Center has a bunch. Um, there's a lot of things out there and there's a lot of people ready to talk. Um, we are very, very happy to talk facility specific information because a lot of times people are like, oh, but my situation doesn't fit what I just read. Um, so feel free to give us an email at raptorevents at umn.edu and we're happy to try to help support every way we can so that we can make sure we keep taking care of wildlife but also keep everybody safe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hall. Uh, and last but not least, we have uh, Dr. Dennis Kohler, wildlife disease biologist with USDA Wildlife Services, here to talk to us about wild bird contact mitigation. Thanks, Ashley. Yeah, um, so one of the things I want to talk about, I, I'll, I'll do this as, as um, brief as possible. Um, I'm just going to highlight some of the things that the other speakers presented so that we have some time for, for questions and things. But highlighting what Dr. Wood said about the wild bird mitigation things and, and, and where that map is on the wild bird website for USDA is, is critical. But the other thing everybody has to understand is the dynamic. Um, I think the map she was using is the current one we have on there. But after tonight, we'll be highlighting Michigan on that website as well. Um, Dr. Dennison made some comments about every facility is unique. And what I'd like to highlight on that is um, Wildlife Services has state programs um, in every state. And we recommend that you contact your Wildlife Services state director or the state office so that they can, if you wanna have ideas about how to mitigate uh, wild birds uh, from your exhibits um, and other facilities that you may have questions with. Dr. Zachariah, I, yeah, the, we, we were well aware of what's happened in the zoo and, and the black vulture incident as well as the scops. You know, the other species that people have been mentioning as well um, are, are really highly effective, but this virus compared to the outbreak in 2015 is really um, hitting a number of other species. Um, really the raptors is, is getting hit hard this time as well as uh, we've even had um, uh, detections in brown pelicans, American white pelicans, um, and some of these other unknown species a little bit too. Uh, We've had a lot of die-offs from uh, snow geese and Canadian geese at this time, as well as um, some other uh, crane species which have been observed in, in other countries. Um, and so, you know, uh, Dr. Balance made the same thing about making assessments. If you're having trouble making assessments, you don't know, Wildlife Services personnel from our state offices can come in and help with those things because they have mitigation strategies, like Dr. Dennison mentioned about 
uh, horizontal gridding of wires and things. We can do flagery. We can also do other hazing techniques um, for different species because we know what different species are affected by, by different mitigation practices. So if you have those questions, please don't hesitate to contact our state directors or contact me through um, Ashley and, and we can, uh, I can get you that information as soon as possible. And Dr. Hall at the Raptor Center, I, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the species that they're mentioning and things like that, uh, the eagles are really uh, troublesome. We've had a number of eagles that are coming up positive right now and, and the scavenging that's going on with these carcasses and stuff like that. So um, I would just limit that to uh, uh, calling your local state wildlife agencies if you do come across uh, a, a wild bird mortality to have us come out and sample and we can get those um, hopefully off the landscape as well. Ashley, that's all I have for wildlife services. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Dr. Kohler. Uh, so we do have uh, about 10 minutes left for Q&A today. Uh, so as a reminder, you can submit questions through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And if your question is directed towards a specific panelist or panelists, please make sure to note that in the submission. Um, and you should, uh, as attendees, be able to also view questions that have already been answered because there has been a lot of discussion um, going on there from our panelists to answer some of those questions in that uh, widget. So first, uh, we have a question for Dr. Wood. Uh, it's, what does the USDA advise for game bird farms, grouse and pheasants, regarding testing to population and release? Would they fall more into the domestic poultry group? Yes, that's a good question. Um, so for the game bird population, um, that has been a topic that has come up more recently and we're trying to um, have good guidance um, for the game bird industry. Um, but in general, um, there has been, um, you know, just kind of similar things, limit your contact with wild birds as much as possible. Um, you can work with wildlife services to um, do a risk assessment of your uh, facility to mitigate um, wild birds that are in your area or on your property. Um, also, it's important to do the proper testing for avian influenza um, for birds that are moving from like your game bird facility, um, you know, and then there's requirements for AI testing when they move to different states also. So hope that helps answer a little bit. Wonderful, thank you very much. Uh, on a related note, there's a question, um, and I'm thinking Dr. Kohler, probably you're the best person to answer this. As we're working to deter wild migratory birds from nesting near captive collection areas, are we at risk of violating any Migratory Bird Act protections? Yes, in some area, in some instances you would be. And if in that situation, what I would recommend is contacting your state wildlife agency as well as um, the US Fish and Wildlife Service. They're the ones that help with migratory uh, bird um, issues and permitting and some of the things that we have to do for mitigating on that. So my recommendation again would be to contact your state DNR or wildlife agencies, as well as your U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service local representative. Wonderful, thank you. Um, there's also a question for Dr. Wood here. Any detections to this point on the West Coast outside of the bald eagles in Southwest Canada? Not at this time, yep. Just what she just mentioned. Um, but we really, at this point, we really have to make the assumption that it's everywhere, you know, and, and yeah, it has been found in all uh, four flyways within the United States. Thank you, Dr. White. Uh, a second follow-up question, any comments on Canada geese as potential asymptomatic carriers? Currently what we've seen in Canada geese, we, we have the, the one of the issues that's is with the poor timing of HPI coming into the country is that it's after the hunting season. And so we really can't tell with Canada geese if, if virus gets into the population, um, if any of them will be uh, healthy and remain asymptomatic. Um, the Canada geese that we've been collecting and analyzing have either been from a die off or neurologic. And so I really can't answer that question right now. Thank you. Uh, another question, 
who specifically should a uh, facility contact if they need to test birds for HPAI, the veterinarian? Um, I'm just knowing we have a lot of folks in our audience that might not have a staff veterinarian. And I don't know, Dr. Dennison, um, if you would like to take that one. Sorry, I was just trying to look up the EPA page on on uh, that. Which which question was that? I'm sorry. Uh, so for those facilities uh, that might not have a veterinarian um, or might not be aware, what should be their first step in terms of who to contact if they need to test a bird for HPAI? If you have a suspect bird, in other words, a bird showing signs suspicious of it, I would contact your your state veterinarian's office first. And, and tell them what you're seeing and, and they should be able to follow up on that. But, but I'll, I'll, I'll put in a plug. I mean, I think every captive wild bird facility should have a, a relationship with a veterinarian, so. Absolutely, thank you very much. Uh, another question, um, and this is really for everyone. Uh, we're struggling with bringing in our free roaming peafowl and maintaining their welfare. We don't have issues with wild waterfowl on grounds, but do have raptors and songbirds. What are everyone's thoughts on bringing in other collection species and leaving peafowl outside to reduce risk as much as possible for them? And I don't know, maybe. Uh, Dr. Hall or Dr. Kohler, if either of you may have thoughts on that question. Go ahead, Dr. Hall, if you wanna take that. Oh, I'll give it a shot and then you can chime in. I mean, it, it, it's all about risk, right? So when you have birds roaming, they are more likely to come um, into contact with other birds that are out there. Um, and we know if it's in your area, then it's in the environment. So uh, there is a lot of that balance though about welfare versus risk of HPAI, um, but you do have a bird more at risk. And then if you have HPAI at your facility with free roaming PFAL, then they're gonna be involved in, in whatever risk assessment follow-up that's gonna happen. So I'll see if Dr. Kohler has other thoughts. No, I, uh, that's, that's a great recommendation. I'm, I, strict, I stick to wildlife. And so PFAL and things like that, I would, I would recommend for what Dr. Hall is is suggested. Thank you both very much. Uh, and I think we have time for one last question today. Uh, in a bird that is actively, who, that's infected with HPAI and recovers, how long are they considered active shutters? Are they considered active indefinitely? And we don't know um, if Dr. Wood, you have an answer to that one? Sure, for um, gallinaceous birds, typically for high path AI, the incubation period is about 14 days. Um, but for waterfowl species, they're in the natural carriers or reservoirs, so they can actually carry the virus for um, a little bit longer. Um, so there's lots of research. Um, and I will say that for the wild bird species, it's not very well studied or very well understood. So it's a little bit difficult to uh, give a direct answer. This okay. is Kevin Edison. I think one way to address that is if you have a bird that tests HPAI positive, and it's, let's say, a conservation, uh, important conservation bird that you want to treat, uh, probably your response plan is going to include serial testing of that bird so that you'll know when it's no longer shedding virus. So I, I think that's part of the response plan. Thank you both very much. And one last question for uh, Dr. Wood. Someone just asking for clarification. Um, they had heard someone mention sparrows, but are not seeing them listed on the species that were found positive with HPAI for 22. Um, is there any clarification on that that can be provided? 
Right. So in this 2022, um, the wild bird detections, there have not been any sparrows that have been detected yet, but we um, believe that sparrows and other songbirds can be um, at least mechanical carriers. And during the 2015 outbreak um, with the commercial uh, poultry farms, um, there were lots of um, sparrows and songbirds in the area. And just to, just to um, go on to what Dr. Wood is saying as well, um, sparrows and songbirds like that, they're in the area, um, European starlings, uh, rock doves, pigeons, um, and things like that can be fomites for it, as well as we've, we've sampled a number of sparrows on different affected facilities so far this year um, in the hundreds, and we have seen zero virus from that. Not saying that it can't happen, but currently we don't have any evidence that um, they are affected by the virus as of yet. Wonderful. Thank you both very much. Uh, so we are at uh, 6.30 p.m. our ending time here. I do want to just give a moment for our wonderful panelists who joined us today uh, to see if anyone has any closing remarks they want to go over or any open questions that they would like to respond to before we uh, do close out. I'll just make one comment. Um, if you need, if you're in a situation where this is happening or it's in your state or you have concerns, contact your state veterinarians, either poultry side, wildlife side. They've been incredibly helpful for us in our situation. And um, it's just the best thing you can do is just reach out and talk to them and get their help because they are the ones with all the resources and um, yeah, they're fantastic. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Zachariah, and to all of our panelists for joining us today. We do still have some open questions, and we will do our best to get answers to those um, and include updated information as well as some of the questions that were answered in text on our website, zap.org, zhp.org. Uh, we'll also be posting a recording of this webinar there, um, along with some additional resources. There's links to find your state veterinarian uh, and other helpful information, security strategy resources that can be used to develop biosecurity plans. Uh, if you do have any follow-up questions that you have not gotten a chance to ask, uh, you'll have an opportunity to enter those in uh, a follow-up survey that will appear at the close of this webinar. Uh, thank you all again for joining us, and we'll leave uh, this open for just a few minutes in case anyone had any information they wanted to capture uh, right now from the answered questions. Thank you very much, and good night.